Hello? Okay, I get. I guess this works. All right, I'm just gonna be here and I'm gonna tell you guys a story, how we got here. Um, you know, uh, I'm Reginald Mbarike. I am the Mobile Health Technology Fellow at Harvard University. I became this in the year 2014. Um, in the year 2013, I built the first fully functional telehealth app that allows live voice and video stream over one platform that applied artificial intelligence onto the same platform and then connects with doctors in real time. At that time, it was illegal to carry medical records physically outside a hospital due to HIPAA regulations. So earlier, we had a group of doctors talking about the future of, of health care and health data and um, we're forgetting that a very short period ago, it was literally illegal to look at your cell phone and see your own medical record. So I had to head to Harvard University and present myself to the deans of the Faculty of Arts and Science and prove that this kind of technology will be able to help improve human condition. And if they let me stay there long enough, that I could prove it. So what I did was I went to each doctor at the School of Medicine and each doctor at the Harvard School of Public Health and I presented to, the STEM, to them individually to show them the future of their healthcare industry. And the doctors we saw speaking earlier today were speaking of some things that could happen in the future. I'm here to tell you that the future is now. So what did we see and, and how did the future become now? We all know that it's the COVID era. Um, what happened in COVID first, this legislation to pass that allowed for doctors to be able to just uh, openly see patients um, all over the place. We heard about the doctor earlier who said he was seeing 1,000 patients a month and he's now seeing 2,000 patients a day. Not him specifically, but his practice. So what we looked at eight years ago was social entrepreneurship in health markets. Social entrepreneurship in health markets. So when we talk about health care, you have to care to have health care. And we wanted to show that the decision to improve the livelihoods and the lives of people who do not have proper access to health, that someone needed to care about that. And people needed to care. So we recruited of all those doctors, up to 25 of them decided to join our team as our steering committee and advisory board. And um, we launched a five-year clinical trials between U.S., India, U.S., Nigeria, because it was illegal to conduct those clinical trials in America due to HIPAA regulations. And um, by the time COVID came out in 2020, what we had was everybody seeing it. You know, hospitals full, packed. Um, People don't even know when to go to, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. People, um, you know, um, doctors needed more and better information about COVID. It changed every month, um, every week, sometimes every day. And we didn't know, we needed better data. The patients needed better data. And the hospitals needed more data. So what we did in the year 2015, I gave a presentation um, to doctors at, at, uh, at Harvard and posted it on YouTube uh, in March of 2015, in which I described the future of the healthcare industry. So if you go to YouTube and you put Digital Diagnostics Harvard, at some point, you know, now we're talking about Digital Diagnostics, so you'll see me on the front page. And in that, I explained that after three years in Silicon Valley, I realized that uh, the people who are the best technologists, who have the best capabilities to create the best technology, were too busy making video games. And that at some point, they were going to switch to healthcare once it becomes a sizable market. 
So by that point, there would be so many telehealth apps that people would be too confused on which ones to choose. They will be marketed for money, they will use you for money, and you'll never get the best care. It'll confuse doctors, it'll confuse patients with too many options. So we said if we build one here that we can evaluate which one and which kind of care would be the best care possible, then when that market hits, we'll be there with a better product than all of these folks. And what we have is a SaaS product where you can now post your symptoms. If, uh, so we, we brought it out in 2021 after watching what we anticipated in 2020, app after app after app doing the same exact thing, everyone mimicking doctors on demand, everyone mimicking teledoc, everyone doing the same exact thing. All artificial intelligence in all of these apps asking the same exact questions. Folks from countries like Ukraine and, and, uh, 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 and all over the world making apps for American hospitals from outside America, just changing the white labels, and you're going from hospital to hospital with no new, well, with limited new innovation. So we looked and said, okay, people need to be able to manage their symptoms at home. People need to be able to check their symptoms at home. The hospitals are being overcrowded, and people need to have better information during telehealth visits so that, or during medical visits in person so that the doctors now with the Given Health app now can have chronological information to the pathology of your illness. And it took, I said, five years to design this and we were able to put together about 85 different algorithms to a supposed potential cross-border disease that might occur. Um, it started when Ebola came out. Uh, then uh, we still couldn't get recognition on, on that. Then Zika came out in 2017, 2016. And um, we just stayed in it until people finally noticed that global health equity is necessary. It's not an option, it's a need that we must face. So, you have, a, you have an app, you, you just had COVID, and um, you have, you've had COVID, you've had uh, the vaccine, uh, so maybe you had COVID and you took one of these new COVID medications, um, and you know, you want to monitor it. You want to know, we do not know what's going to happen. We don't know how many other diseases will be affected by the COVID you already had. Um, so we set up 85 different data model, uh, points on you, you know, the diff these different issues and uh, topics that you just have on a cell phone. And what would make you go to your phone on a day and say, oh, I have a sore throat. Day two, I had a, a runny nose day three and four, so also how to incentivize the use of this product. And this is what it looks like. You go in, um, so we, we designed this post-COVID one last year. You put in your information, you check your symptoms on a, um, on a systems checker, and then you place it into what we call a symptoms calendar. Um, by the time you see a doctor, you now have the power to send that doctor your information. I felt like divine intervention when I was sitting down here and the doctor asked me who owns your patient information. And I was like, okay, I go up next. This is wonderful. And you now can create your electronic medical record, maintain your electronic rec medical record, and submit it to a doctor and watch the doctor appointment have better outcomes. Watch how much healthier you will be when the doctor is not busy doing paperwork, looking for your information, trying to do something that is just not focused on you at that moment. Um, these doctors are very busy. The better data they have, the better information, the more actionable information, the better they can treat you. So this is an example of how many things you can look at um, on the, on the right-hand side is 
uh, so many potential post-COVID diseases that you might get. On the left-hand side is um, just an example of the kind of different data points um, that uh, you know we're looking at. So I had COVID four months after a major car accident. Uh, a car accident. It was a hundred mile an hour car collision, head-to-head uh, -head collision, um, where all of my joints were disrupted. Uh, about three or four days into having COVID, all of the physical therapy that I did um, before that was went out the window. All of the joints that hurt immediately after the accident was hurting severely immediately. And so um, when I had the COVID vaccine, um, the, the night uh, of having that vaccine, I felt like my heart was going to erupt. It felt volcanic. Uh, no told me about this, these potential uh, um, things. And um, I had to Google them and found out that uh, heart enlargement is a potential uh, result of the COVID vaccine. It would have been nice to know that because my dad died of a heart attack. It would have been good to have that information. So um, here we're going to give you an example of exactly how it works and show you that this can work in different diseases. Go back and um, if you can click on it. I don't know if I can, if you can. If we can't, we'll move on. We'll just keep it there if you can't click on it. And um, what we had was we were recruited by the telemedicine uh, team at MD Anderson, which is the number one cancer institute in the world, on how to use this kind of symptoms monitoring for their global patients. In each of their different cancer departments. So this use of COVID is barely the way to show that it can be used for other illnesses. So what happens next? What is the really next thing that, that, that we're talking about when I say the future is now? Imagine you put all that information on your uh, symptoms in and now your app has machine learning applied to it, learning about your ailments. Imagine if the codes for that machine learning have already been developed over an eight year period. And imagine if then, the result, when you want to see a doctor, the, there's artificial intelligence on the app that connects you to a doctor in the area of specialization that your symptoms highlighted. And imagine if that's already existing. It is. So we had enough time to get the data of every single doctor in the United States of America separated by CPT code, every single hospital in the United States of America, every insurance provider, and code it. That's what time leads to. That's what caring leads to. So our team is bigger than this. We have 25, uh, 30 doctors uh, who are, uh, 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 you know, they spent their own money and their own time to get us this far. But these are the active people working on this. To the left is Dr. Joseph Slokowski. You'll see him on that, if you, once again, if you go to Digital Diagnostic Harvard, um, he shows up. He's been the president of our company um, since 2015, uh, even though we were just launching it as a stealth startup um, and um, brought up our first commercial product last year. He's a former chief medical officer of Subaru Motors, so his expertise is population health. Um, and once again, we're doing this for population health. And David on the right hand side is uh, focused on regulation because we have to deal with that at every moment of the day. So the competitors that I spoke of before, we have uh, folks that you've probably heard of Amwell, you've probably heard of Teladoc, you've probably heard of Doctors Down the Man. Probably haven't heard of Healing Health and Patient Tory. Those are smaller companies that have been funded in the last four or so years. Um, so we focus globally. We want you to be 
able to use this product regardless of what country you're in. Uh, we're talking about patient access and global health equity. Um, and it's, it's, it's great that health equity has been something over the COVID period that we hear on TV now every now and then. It's good, it's good, it's good that at least it's a term used on, on television. Um, uh, so we're, 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 we're taking that and we're pushing it forward. So, uh, where's the money? Well, if you focus on the quality of your innovation, if you focus on what you want to do to help people's lives, the money will show up. So the very last thing we did was focus on the revenues. And then, you can see the revenues are expansive, potentially. You have hospitals needing the data. You have pharmaceuticals needing the data. You have insurance companies needing the data. Why? Insurance companies need to know how to recruit, maintain, and retain patients. Um, they want to know what are the potential illnesses that could cause patients to die, and they would like to have, you know, um, patients monitoring themselves so that once they have the patients in there, um, it's less expensive to take care of those patients under their insurance. Pharmaceuticals. Um, what we did, we held an event at the Harvard Faculty Club uh, called the uh, Global Health Transformation. Um, and it was originally called Global Health Equity Event. And we had zero attendees. So that on uh, the last month, we changed the transformation and 30 people showed up. Uh, at that event, we put together a group. These 30 people were the best and the brightest when it comes to health innovation in New England, um, in the Boston area. And um, what, 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 what was being considered at that time is where is where and how can this be monetized? Where and how can this be monetized? And um, now we have hospitals that are ready to have this technology to move forward, to get their doctors better patient data, to reduce the paperwork that the doctors have, to allow them to run more efficiently, and to have the patients be healthier when they come to see them. So we are raising a $5 million seed round. Uh, which, once again, is not our priority. Priority is to get this directly to hospitals. So if we close, uh, you know, um, those that will work better. Um, we're looking at grants to, to, to raise this to get us to as, as far as it can go. Um, and very grateful to have seen the National Institute of Health here and uh, had a great discussion. So. We are very, feeling very positive of, uh, of the outcome with them. And that's all she wrote, ladies and gentlemen. Any questions? Please. So for the end user, yes. the patient, yes. you, you get the app. Yes. You can have your records on the app, yes, and you get connected to a doctor when you need help, but yes. who's paying the doctor for the visit? Okay, so we would like you to deal with doctors that collect your health insurance, right? That, that are connected to your health insurance, and that's kind of the model we're going with now. The original model we were going with uh, around 2013, 2014, when we conceived this, was, you know, you pay the doctor. At that time, doctors at man was $50 per visit. Okay, we're going to compete with them. Let's make ours $45, $35. Um, there was no um, uh, ICD-10 code, CPT code, uh, that for insurance companies at the time that paid for telemedicine visits. Um, the first one came out in the spring of 2016 by um, uh, 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 Blue Cross Blue Shield. And as the doctor said earlier today, they started opening up in March of 2020 due to COVID. So, yes, so we, we, we that's why we, when I said earlier, the data of every health insurance company and every hospital is necessary behind the data of the app in order to, <clears throat> to effectively make it happen fast. So, you, so the app will help you find, because it, it gives you room to check 
your insurance provider when you're, when you're filling in your information. So you put your insurance provider, the app can then lead you to a doctor that matches your symptoms, that takes your insurance. Great question. I haven't had that question before. Any other questions? Okay, so it is an honor to be here. Um, and it's an honor to present this to you. Uh, I'm very grateful for this opportunity and I'm looking forward to future collaborations. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.